Hello there guys, it's Celine. yes, it is really me. <laughs> Today is Tuesday, the 24th of November 2020, yes, and I am still alive. I hope you too, as you are watching this, obviously you are still alive, in one form or another. <laughs> what a year we've had, I don't even want to think about it. So there's going to be weird lighting issues. <laughs> What is this? It's the sun. The sun's shining. Uh, I think it's reflecting on a metal band over there on the top of my little outhouse. And it's just doing this weirdness now. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of neat in a way. And it won't stay all the time because obviously the sun is moving position. Um, let me think, it's probably towards two o'clock in the afternoon, so I will be here for a bit, I hope. I've got a ton of notes. I want to do a TUMO progress report again. Also, you know, putting in a lot of uh, recommendations and general chit chat and ideas and things that I've encountered. And there's quite a lot of that. So I've got notes. Which is why I will be looking down occasionally, or more than once, to uh, keep track of my story here. Um, the Where I left you, or us, basically, with this uh, this whole thing, is that I, I, other than the, you know, mushroom updates and little bits of forest and things like that, I have had one rather big deal, uh, transformative change happening to me recently uh, because of the TUMO process, TUMO practice actually I should say, that I have been uh, doing all year, all of 2020. And it is the opening and aligning of the chakras that has happened as a result of what I was doing with my TUMO. Now if, you have, if you're new here and you have never heard me talk about TUMO before, I do this for a number of reasons. It has, it's a, a Tibet, Tibetan originally, uh, I think, Indian, uh, Tibetan uh, meditation practice where you work with Kundalini energy. So rather than, there's loads of people who are having Kundalini experiences and there's lots of intel on the internet about both Tantra, Yoga, chakras, all that stuff, and it has always appealed to me, it has always, I've grown up with the terminology to a large extent, however, I've got lots of reasons why I end up, where my my final, my end station, end of the line, kind of a, you know, uh, process so far, has uh, become this TUMO approach, because it just became very easy for me to do uh, really quickly. It involves uh, connecting with your Kundalini Shakti energy. I use those names uh, more or less, you know, either one of them uh, alternatively um, because Kundalini is a very well known term. It is the same thing that I'm referring to with those words, Kundalini and Shakti are the same thing. It is the earth energy that is personal to you in your body as you sit there and it comes up through your root chakra or at least through the perineum which is at the bottom most part of in between your bottoms right there so that's an area that can grow hot quite easily and that's important so the TUMO starts with that, with acknowledging that. I have done what I've called Shakti energy work for the whole of 2019. So before this, right? And as I sort of felt that I had more or less gotten out of my approach with that, there's playlists on my channel, go check it out if you're interested. Um, as I felt that I was more or less getting to the bottom of those things, I felt that, okay, so maybe this is a good time in early 2020 to 
investigate this whole TUMO notion more and find out what it is that they're talking about. For some reason, it just drew me in just like that. And so that was in January. Quite quickly, after a couple of weeks, I think, of fairly regular, I'm regular with this because it is really easy for me to do. Uh, one of the points that I'm going to point out in my uh, in my endless long talk here, which uh, <laughs> you are apparently in for today. <laughs> Welcome. I, I'm so glad you're here, you know, <laughs> is that uh, it's really an inner process. So it's an energy process. It is something that you are supposed to actually feel. And I have stressed this before and I'm going to do that again. It is not a visualization. So... Visualizing any relevant material for you may help. It may support you. It may guide your steps, certainly in the beginning. That's all fine. But we must be aware that what we are doing is visualizing. And it's not the same as an actual change in the energies. And I think it's partly the curse of the Western world to believe that what we have in our brains can actually manifest saving the world and humanity and the whole life on, on the earth, you know, because that's only partly true. It's, it's not irrelevant. The mind is not irrelevant to the process, but the mind should be a servant along with everything else. And we should know what we are doing. So yeah, so there, <laughs> that was a little sermon for me. I'm going to have to remind myself to have frequent loops of tea because otherwise this isn't going to happen. So the last thing that I left us with was this chakra realignment. This is a massive deal. I cannot express, I cannot begin to say how massive this deal is. And I had not seen it coming. <laughs> not in a million years. I had no clue that this was important. So there you go. See, I just blunder into this and... I can tell it feels good, so that's my criterion, always. I Does this feel good? Does this feel expansive? Does this feel like how I'm supposed to be? How do I know that? I don't know, I figure it out. I've been on this planet for a while and I have quite a lot of experience with not feeling aligned and attuned and in harmony with things and all that. So, yes, that has taught me the other direction I think more than anything else. A lot of those themes of how you deal with your own reactions to things, how you get used to them, all that will come back again and again in my in these in these videos, in my types of uh, of check-ins and reports and stuff. So one thing I've noticed, um, especially today, even with my realigned uh, chakras, my chakras are open they're facing forward and i can even see that if i'm a, if i pay attention to it you know i can sort of be sensitive to what it is doing right there still feels rather new and a bit raw and a bit like you know you have to find a way to make that work for yourself one thing that i've noticed uh in particular is that i can uh, actually get along with dogs much better than ever before and it's been coming for a while now but I've actually talked to three dogs during my little walk just now and that is just like I don't know I connect and there is a joy in the dogs that responds to me you know I interact with the dogs in a way that's completely non-verbal I don't own dogs I only have a cat who is like way yonder asleep always and she's fine as well you know i can have a sort of a non-verbal interaction with her just as well and that's completely fine as well but it's less personal and less um, i don't know less there's less going on than with even dogs that i don't don't know at all i just walk with you know i'm just walking in the park and with other people with dogs walking in the park so yeah um another thing i've noticed and that's kind of subtle is that if i go into a white light healing mode which is another 
energy work approach that I use often to get rid of darker energies that I carry around with me. Um, there's more intel about that on the channel as well in the playlist. It tends to be different now, probably because over here there's all sorts of levels of perception that are sort of interfering or interfacing with what I'm used to. And everything is becoming more personal. Yes, that too. And less mechanistic, therefore. And it is interesting because where there used to be white light only for a particular purpose that I could ask to engage for some reason or other, you know, in my in my energy situation, in my vibrational situation. I tend to very easily get sidetracked now. I have fragments of visionary things going on. I don't know what's going on. It's interesting and it's cool. And sometimes it feels like uh, there is bits of dream country going coming on. It looks kaleidoscopic. It looks even a bit trippy, but not in the state where I am myself becoming fuzzy. It's, it feels like there's parts of me being accessed in different realms, different dimensions. They're being accessed. So if I say it like that, that actually feels like, okay, so that's probably what it is. There's, so maybe <laughs> this is the beginning of a whole new, you know, series of processes that probably, you know, each time I think, okay, look at this. Now I've got this huge big deal in my life and this is it. Now I can actually go and have a life. <laughs> I make myself laugh because, dang, yeah, <laughs> I didn't used to have a life and yeah, so, well. So, this imaginary world kind of a dealio, I'm still calling it that, visionary worlds, this, um, it's really hard to describe so far. It's like the light, the healing light that I'm calling to interface with my situation is very willing to present itself in all sorts of layers and, and manners and you want to see this you want to see this you know it talks to me like they tell you a uh, psilocybin mushroom does which i haven't touched yet so who knows whatever else is going on you know so this is a sort of a side effect of the chakra realignment otherwise than that it feels particularly brilliant i am uh, also i must say on the i think third day of my period and so the menstrual and hormonal business is relevant to my next chapter in my story here even though i find it less than particularly fabulous to talk about i'd rather talk about the dreamlands and all the extensive expansive interesting things going on out there It's a chopper. I can't do anything about that. Um, the, the, the thing is that I've noticed during my period and also at the times that I wasn't feeling particularly fabulous, you know, because there's energy system things that I've been investigating that I will talk to, be, to you about in a bit. Um, energy blockages happening with hormonal, with the hormonal cycle, right? That's essential. I think that's particularly important. It's something that nobody ever talks about in relation to Kundalini Yoga or any of it. So that's coming right now. Um, I noticed that I could see more chakra aliveness for myself all over. You know, my whole set of chakras was way more available to the world which feels amazing it feels like okay so i have my period but it's not a it's not like i'm i need to be depressed about anything at all i can just be myself and have my hormones do their thing so yay for that because excellent so moving on 
I have wondered often how many chakras are there, really. So everybody uh, throws, throws this image at you of those seven chakras and I just think it's a summary, really. I think that's all it really is and I think that's all it was ever supposed to be. The set of seven and what with the internet, what everybody does is copy-paste, you know, endlessly, everybody else's intel and pretty pictures are always popular. <laughs> So that's what you get. But by now, I mean, it's nearly 2021 over here, you know, where you are and where I am. And it's time to update our, our file, really, of that system. Because the file dates, I think, from the 1200s or something. I'm not saying that those seven chakras aren't portrayed accurately or that they... The way they show them isn't true or whatever. I'm saying that it's basically a very simplified version of what's really going on in here or in there, right? And one way that I had of noticing this is in connection with my hormonal cycle again. I am, uh, I've always been, I suppose, over the past 10 years or so, certainly, rather aware of my hormonal cycle and of my level of levels of energy. That's my basic issue that I have with this whole thing, is that you can only uh, access such or such a level of energy at a given time in the hormonal cycle. It sucks. What can you do? You know, there's moments of high energy and there's other moments where the energy can be used but only in this that or the other way and so on and so forth so working on that i have gone into my underbelly and where i bring up my shakti energy through uh, my root basically just in front of my tailbone basically there's the first what i call now checkpoint okay the checkpoints, there's three of them in total, are quite close to the bottom uh, area, literally bottom area of your spine, that have to do with getting the kundalini energy where you want it to go, or not, or not being able to get it to go there at all. Three different points. The first checkpoint is the actual root chakra itself. So... I've stressed this before and it's massively important, so I'm going to talk about it again. The first chakra, the whole area of the perineum and the tailbone and the base of your bottom, basically right there, has everything to do with feeling safe, feeling secure and being okay inside your own body as it is, exactly as it is. And no other way, you know. Um, and being able to relax enough in there so that the Shakti comes in. I call this a checkpoint because already, I'm sorry about the dancing bit in my glasses there because it's reflecting over there now. <laughs> so you'll have to look at the dancing bit for a while, just like me. <laughs> it's nasty. Um, maybe if I sit a bit more like that. Does that help? Just a bit. You get dark light issues again. So, yeah. Anyway, first checkpoint, okay? So, if you have issues in there, if feeling safe is already a big deal, uh, like a massive, ooh, I don't know if I feel safe. I don't know if I can feel safe. I don't know. Um, I don't feel safe. You know, how am I going to get this done if I don't even feel safe? Wow. Um, it's something that you have to address. You have to, it's quite possible that once you get your Shakti energy going in there, you will actually feel safer. You will be able to make, you know, huge leaps of progress in there. You will be able to establish yourself better. Because a lot of our problems, I think almost all of our problems in the world as humans in whatever form of, or shape, are due to one cause, one origin only, 
And that is a lack of energy. I'm going to move you over this side, so like that. So because now there's no bouncing light. Excellent. Point number two. The second uh, checkpoint, okay? It is about this much going up in a more or less curved line along the spine from the from the root from the tailbone okay there is a checkpoint there that will try to divert any and all shakti kundalini energy into the sexual system because we're programmed to reproduce our bodies are programmed i should say to reproduce to produce offspring so that the next generation and the next generation and the next generation will populate the earth is a programming it's a physical dna genetic ingrained programming that has there's older <laughs> older than human speech human language older than lots of things so that's a checkpoint it's important to realize what do you want? Do you want sexual activity at that point? Is that a good idea? Maybe it is. There are moments where it's what you need to, you know, get stabilized, get, you know, there's reasons why it's a part of your life. It's a part of your body. If you have children, there may be more going on in the sense that this whole story of my checkpoints here will be even more important to you, I think, than to me, who is not a mother. Okay. You can, you can, you have to figure this out for yourself. The thing is, there, it's a, it's possible. It's certainly possible, and uh, not even that difficult with a bit of practice, to find your way around that. So to choose to not spend it in there to not spend the shakti in the sexual system because once it's in there that's where it'll go and it will not be transformed anymore it will be spent it will be it will be gone it's not that it's pointless it's just that it you cannot call it back or do any anything kundalini relevant with it afterwards you know that's not happening so you have to have the choice, you have to have the option at checkpoint number two to say, okay, so we're not doing that now. We're going to break through to the next level. So at that point, there's like this, almost like a kissing gate, you know, like a little door going this way or that way. Which one is it? And you have to figure that out for yourself, how it feels, and then to proceed forward, upward, along the spine to the next third and I think biggest uh, checkpoint of all which has to do and it tends to be, be actually in, in some uh, moments in my life certainly moments in my hormonal cycle there it is again see <laughs> it's gonna be there for a while uh, there's a Virgin Mary Mother Mary statue sitting in there which you won't be able to see in my glasses or maybe you can I don't know there it is anyway how appropriate because that third checkpoint tends to, as I was going to say, transform into a blockage quite easily. It doesn't have that much to do with reproduction anymore at that point, but it does have to do with the fact that certainly for females, and I think nearly 100% of my viewers are females, which is good. Hi, girls. Um, I know you're out there. This is essential because our uterine systems and i'm not talking just sexual here i'm talking the reproductive the whole all that you know the whole thing has never in our lives had enough energy to do its thing ever what i'm saying right now i'm going to move over to like this a bit more <laughs> I'll just be doing this for a, for a while to get rid of the dancing blob in my glasses because yeah apparently that's a thing today 
when there is a lack of energy in any of those in any of those systems and particularly the uterine system the ovaries the whole hormonal kitten caboodle that's just grinding on juice through the years i mean i got my first period when i was 12 and i am 54 and a half to date okay i have had i do not care to count how many periods <laughs> Each time it is uh, three, four days of, you know, like that, which is fine, unless I have work to do and then it sucks. And you know what I'm talking about, right? The whole problem of that is a lack of energy. And the interesting thing is that there is actually an interaction constantly going on between the three checkpoints. If this one has an opinion about not letting enough energy in because I don't feel safe because all those two are unhappy and they're bringing the unhappiness down, then this one's feeling unsafe and it's not letting any energy in. How simple can I make it? That's how simple it is. This one, the middle one, tends to go, yay, let's go have men raining men, you know, men raining out of the sky. <laughs> For example, you know, just in general, let's go have a party. Let's go use up all the available energy and then another 10% in that. In having sex, having romantic relationships, engaging in the endless affairs between compatible personalities, whether they're male or female, I don't care. It's all the same. So it tends to... That, that's where the sexual predator idea lives, in the middle checkpoint, the second one. See? This is becoming a really lengthy tale. I will be here for a bit. Am I half an hour in? No, not quite. <laughs> I have to speed this up or I will have to cut this in portions again. Because, uh, yeah. In either of those two situations, of either of those two feeling like, let's go spin it all or let's, I'm not feeling any or I'm not, you know... Number three is like downward dog. It's not getting what it needs. So it, this takes a bit of weaving and winding your way to even get to checkpoint number three. And on top of this, I feel myself that this whole history of the lack of energy by itself that is sort of inscribed in the third checkpoint, which is situated another three or four digits above the second one. So more or less level with the top side of where your womb is as a female, right there, just beneath it. There's a whole uh, history, her story, okay? Ancestral charge and pressure in that third checkpoint of not being allowed energy even if you get it you're not supposed to profit from it you're not supposed to be you fill in the words you know them just as well as i do so if that is how this one how number three thinks of itself it will always feel fear I believe a lot, a lot of our physical fear in life that we can uh, sometimes even not be aware of for decades, you know, in our own lives, actually has to do with this area uh, in, um, in our anatomies, where it's actually possible for number three to disapprove of what number two is doing. See? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I'm making that quite clear now. The interaction between the three checkpoints is important and it just, you just have to figure out a way to actually basically get the whole Shakti past them, through the middle of them and see what happens also. See what happens uh, if you pass the, the Shakti through first of all the first chakra is just happy and feels lots better it's energized everything becomes energized checkpoint number two 
uh, is fine, you know. Okay, so this energy is going elsewhere, which is fine. I don't care, you know. It's being used. Energy is being used. That's all that point cares about. In my opinion, at this point, okay, because all this is also a progress report coming from me as I sit here in this particular state. That's why I'm always giving you the time and date and where I am and <laughs> what weather it is and so on and so forth because I'm trying to be slightly scientific about this because <laughs> I think that's funny because <laughs> there's no such thing. Anyway, the third uh, checkpoint, of course, has the biggest deal because it has this history deal of uh, a history of lack of history. Just go back a couple of generations and you will see people who didn't get enough food, who didn't get the right kind of food, who overworked themselves constantly, who had too many children. How many ancestresses do you have who had too many children? You just go back a couple of generations, it's crazy. So, um, because the machine, the reproductive machine, carried on regardless, which I think is a really lousy setup for many women all over this planet. Right now, today, as we speak, this is still happening. Okay. Um, what I have myself been doing is I've been trying to coax my Shakti over this third checkpoint, through it, and I haven't got it completely mapped out yet. I can see that there is a massive need for my uterine system to absorb as, as an, enough energy to do its thing, you know, for it to do its processes. And so that's what I'm letting it do as much as possible. As soon as I do that, the whole thing relaxes because the demand for the uterine system to be supplied with energy is just massive. You're not going to get around that. You're not going to get around it by denying it what it basically needs to live. This is very key to the female system, I think. So, once I allow quite enough of the Shakti, having gotten past one and two, I have to, you know, allow a lot of the Shakti to actually just go into the uterine system and do whatever it needs to do there. I can feel the difference. It feels warmer. My belly is warm. I don't have belly aches. It's pretty neat. So, yeah. And then what's left of my Shakti at that point can actually go to my lower Dantian to do the magic. And because I have done this all year, and I don't know how many hundreds of times by now, a very little uh, Shakti in there can actually start off an, a full round of Tumo without it being like massive coming out of every pore, you know, that's not even happening right now yet. It's just that it feels so much better because the Shakti transforms in Tumo, into Tumo in the lower Dantian. So the lower Dantian is sitting on top of the uterus right there in the bottom. And it, um, it has actually, and this is my second or third, what is it? Yes, part of third part of my update here. I have um, noticed that if you are in a in a in a tumo situation where your your energy is actually being transformed, there are more of these similar checkpoint kind of energy points, which is why I wonder how many chakras we have because this is all becoming you know more and more of a massive map of Hogwarts, if you like, in my belly. <laughs> so, yeah, I noticed that there is like a circle, a vertical circle going like this through my belly. With every inch or so, there's like a point that becomes incandescent during the Tumo process. And it goes to the front, upward, along the skin of my belly on the inside, up to my solar plexus, then uh, towards the back, underneath my solar plexus, going like this, dig, 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 like that, to my spine again, and there's more checkpoints going back down. So it tends to also even go like that, in a, in a circle-ish, slowly. And um, it's interesting. So let me see what else I wrote down about that, because I think there was another point. Uh, 
it may have something to do with the fact that I perceive this circle of points, that I perceive these um, checkpoints, if you like. This clearly at this point may have something to do with my basic realignment uh, adventure, which was about uh, having a lot of tumor energy and then realigning that actually not on top of the spine, but to either side of my spinal cord like that or my uh, my vertebrae in my back in such a way that my chakras actually got pushed out of their thing that they were in you know the the uh, the state that my chakras were in before was like um, I'm trying to figure out how the, how to say this now it was like a, cur a permanent winter in my chakras at the time. Three weeks ago, I think. <laughs> so the chakras themselves, those seven that we mentioned earlier, okay, that we that we all know, I see them now as sort of end positions of this whole inner uh, column of fire, this whole um inner you know complex complex um levels and layers of, of of different systems the outside of that is those seven chakras possibly and they have a lot to do with actually also how you interact with the world how you perceive how you feel things in the world like my dogs how i go you know how i come into contact with other living creatures it's really interesting, but it's more of an expression side of things. And it, it comes for me, it comes very late after doing all the other inner work, really. Without the Tumo, I would never have had these this whole chakra realignment thing. And I would never have had this sense of I feel more alive than ever before, which is something I've said before, you know, a number of times already. Starting off Tumo, it did that for me straight away. Um, there's other times. I mean, there's other times where a significant helping of truth sort of came into my system. It came into my life. And I went, whoa, what, you know, this is major and it's massive and it's amazing. And what else can you say? It's just, it takes a lot of time to actually also process and make it your own. And... Also, at the same time, it is what I was always supposed to be. So I have to sort of unscrew a lot of my... In my heart area in particular, I find that I still have a lot of pain there. Which is not surprising. What with all, you know, the background story and all that. it It's not an instant fix. Never. Which is good. Which I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I have noticed a connection, another sort of a vibrational connection between this, I think the third checkpoint, basically, and my ears. So yeah, weird. I don't really know why that is either. I could see how it was, how what you hear and being aware in this air, in this part of, you know, things fifth chakra set up, you know, all that. How that is relevant to our culture, most definitely. Um, I'm starting to hear differently. I wrote down one example, <laughs> striking to me example of that, is that I used to be a real fan of Hildegard von Bingen. I'll put a couple of links in the description to this video for you to have a go at that kind of music. It's uh, medieval german uh church music and we listened my husband and i listened to a program or a yeah a live recording of a of a, of a performance in uh, i believe in los angeles um a couple of years ago that we listened to on the tv just you know 10 days ago so on a saturday night and i hated it <laughs> i have had such a hard time because it's very potent music, it has a lot of vibrational properties and it does not 
jive with Tumo energy. The second, dan, the first Dantian, the second chakra, at all. It is the total denial of all that stuff, <laughs> which I found to be striking. I mean, I didn't expect it to be that bad. The thing about the this type of music is that it is created in order to provide peace of mind, stillness of mind, emotional and mental surrender, and so on and so forth. All good things, but often at the detriment of the underbelly. So I want I would like you to listen to some of that and then compare it to a Bulgarian Orthodox uh, choir that I also will put the link in because those are men and what with the uterine problematic you know that I described just now I'm thinking that the Hildegard von Bingen issue I'm having <laughs> has everything to do with that it's actually the same thing which is why the Bulgarian men are fine in my book and they're much closer to with their, you know, slower, lower voices and lower harmonics and all that in the sound. They're actually bringing me an atmosphere that is completely, you know, fine with Tumo. It's, it's different compared to the Tibetan monks. I will also put a link to the mantras that I've been watching. There's two mantras, two Vajra Sattva mantras. I've talked about them before. And that's fascinating because those are made by people who do Tumo. So there's like this big massive advantage that they've got, of course. Combining the Tumo practice with the, this, especially this last Vajra Sattva mantra that I've been listening to, the two different mantras actually, different um, words, you know, that are being sung. They have uh, clearing effects there's there's historically also they're meant to bring you um, in my words they're meant Vajra mantras are meant to bring you to a point of light which I would certainly connect with what we know as our soul star chakra up there it has to do with an inner sense of certainty and a sense of light basically it clears dark stuff away so it is a another parallel mechanism uh to help you get rid of things that you know to support you basically as you do tumo as you do kundalini work it supports you to um with vibrational things you have to do with your thoughts and your emotions yourself there's a lot of vibrational stuff that can still bog you down quite a bit and this m these mantras are extraordinarily powerful what i've found is that it makes the whole thing more personal which is funny in a way because it was personal all along but this um it is about it was always personal but it is about us knowing to what extent it is personal now, right? So th as that awareness becomes deeper and expands, it um, you sit differently in it. It you're 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 going to have issues with you know thinking about your relationship with your soul, your relationship with to what extent are you aware of any of it the divine, etc. You know, it's tricky. For me, there's a level that has that connects with past lives as well, because it seems more and more obvious to me that I have done this before, all this, this whole Tumo thing I've done before, and I am here now in order to put it all together. There's fascinating things happening. I have to take me some more tea. Because um, I have watched people on YouTube doing uh, reviews of material that's actually both Kabbalah and 
in the Indian Hindu mystic, you know, combined. And I feel really connected to that. It feels like it's me, you know, I'm, I've been in there. So all my, my past history in this body, as well as my past lives, which is like beyond that. And the other thing I want to add to that is as my ancestral baggage in the body starts to become neutralized more and more there's more room for me to become aware of beyond that but there isn't really a feeling of okay so this whole problem is solved now and I can just be you know gallivanting about the place which is what I really want to do ever only <laughs> it's not like that it's that the charge shifts into the distance as it becomes more it all becomes more of me more of me more of myself myself has grown so some so to speak which is a good thing because it feels really positive really joyful and what with it not being only about this body but about earlier bodies and incarnations as well, what I'm struck with is that there's only one common factor in all those lives, and that's joy. It was only ever really about the joy for me. And seeing where I'm coming from, that's pretty nice. So yeah, so I'm going to buckle this up right now because it's 40 through six, seven minutes. <laughs> That's enough of that. Thank you for watching and for following along. I do have some general recommendations for the tumor practice uh, in, you know, it, but I'll put that up separately because I think that makes more sense anyway. Thank you again. And I hope this was entertaining and or useful for, for somebody out there. I um, have noticed again that there is a lot of TUMO intel out there that isn't really TUMO intel at all. They tell you that this is what they're presenting and they're not sharing with you what it really, what it really takes. So yeah, so I think that's a bit nasty but it's how it goes in the world. So you always have to nitpick and separate out all the all the stupid basically and all the irrelevant things and find what it is that really works for you right so um, thank you for watching once again and I'll be um, I'll be back soon enough with um, with more of this or similar or completely different thank you ciao for now bye bye